and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Jesus the Son and the Holy Ghost, who is our comforter. The Bible is nothing more than basic instructions before leaving earth or what we must do if we want to live in heaven with God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Ghost, our helper, our comforter, while we're here on this earth. From the beginning, the wiser people who lived upon this earth would seek out the truth about the one and only true living God. All throughout history, we see where the smarter people would seek out the truth about God. For most, under, most people understand this earth is not our home. We're only passing through. And where we wind up in the next life is what really, truly matters. Because the next life, we will either be living with Jesus and all the saints or with Satan and all the misfits and cursed ones. We find in the Torah, which is the Jewish Bible, a book called the Book of Wisdom. And here are some fine words that are written in this book that we should live by. It says, love, righteousness, yea, that be, <clears throat> love, righteousness, ye that be judges of the earth, think of the Lord with a good heart, and in simplicity of heart seek him. For he will be found of them that tempt him not, and showeth himself unto such as do not distrust him. For forward thoughts separate from God and his power, when it is tried, reprove the unwise." For unto a malicious soul wisdom shall not enter, <clears throat> nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit, and remove from thoughts that are without understanding, and will not abide with unrighteousness comes in. For wisdom is a loving spirit, and will not acquit a blasphemer of his words for God, is witness of his reigns, and a true beholder of his heart, and a hearer of his tongue. For the Spirit of the Lord filleth the world, and that which <coughs> containeth all things hath knowledge of the voice. Therefore he that speaketh unrighteousness things cannot be hid, neither shall vengeance when it punishes pass by him. For inquisition shall be made into the counsel of the ungodly, and the sound of his word shall come unto the Lord for the manifestation of his wicked deeds. For the ear of jealousy heareth all things, and the noise of murmuring is not hid. Therefore beware, therefore beware of murmuring, which is unprofitable, and refrain your tongue from backbiting. For there is no word so secret that shall go for naught, and the mouth that believeth slayeth the soul. Seek not death in the air of your life, and pull not upon yourself destruction with the works of your hands. For God made not death, neither had he pleasure in the destruction of the living. For he created all things that they might have their being, and their generations of the world were helpful, and there is no poison of destruction in them, nor the kingdom of death upon the earth. For righteousness is immoral, <clears throat> immortal, but ungodly men with their works and words call it to them. For when they thought to have it their friend, they consumed to naught and made a con covenant with it, because they are worthy to take part with it. Wisdom. When you think of wisdom, is this not what made Solomon a great king? greatest of all kings of all time. For he sought out wisdom rather than gold and silver. We find in the book of Proverbs chapter 8 11 it tells us wisdom is better than rubles and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. We also find in Proverbs 16 16 how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than be chosen than silver? Wisdom in the ways of Jesus is something we need to be seeking out all our life while we're breathing on this earth. And Brother James tells us in the book of James chapter 1, 
Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, and unbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. Notice he said, ask. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he will... <clears throat> for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all ways. <clears throat> Does not the Bible tell us? In the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 5, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Keep in mind, forward thoughts separate from God. Forward simply means this is a person that is difficult to deal with, when they are stubborn, they're disobedient, and they're always going along with the contrary will of God. There are people who want to disrupt people learning about God with vain babbling. We see all throughout the Bible people who were this way, and we see what happens to them. For as the words of wisdom tell us, for into a malicious soul wisdom shall not enter, nor dwell in a body that is subject unto sin. <clears throat> we need to understand what the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7. It tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. You know, many times people talk about fear, and they don't really truly understand. And there's no doubt that most of us fear the Lord. That's why we became a Christian in the first place. Because when we understand what is going on, we don't want to be in hell. But as we come to love Jesus and know Jesus, as we become to understand the Lord, our Father, God in heaven, the fear becomes we don't want to disappoint him. The fear is we definitely don't want to disappoint Jesus for all that Jesus has done for us. Brother James tells all who will listen, let me rephrase this. Brother James is really actually warning all who will hear in James chapter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. When you read this, again, we have to ask in order to receive. We have to seek in order to find. The same thing Jesus tells us in the gospel message as told to us by St. Matthew. Everyone has to know we are tempted as well. While we're going through this life, even Jesus was tempted. All the while he was here on this earth, when you study out closely, you know he's being tempted one way or another by his disciples, by the apostles, by the devil, by the Jewish people themselves, by the rabbis, they all were always tempting him. But, as we are told in his instruction book, Jesus also let us know, and the gospel account is written by St. Mark, uh, chapter 14, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. This is one of the things that why they always talk about, why we have to study, why we have to pray. Because the Spirit truly is wanting us to do what is right, to get back with God. But the flesh, because it stays here on earth after our body is no longer in use, is very weak. Watch and pray. This is why we must study and pray. We must be on guard always, for there is always something trying to pull us off that road that we're on towards heaven. Brother Paul explains this well in the book of Romans chapter 8. And I suggest very strongly you study this out. It has great examples, great explanations of the difference in the flesh and in the spirit and what it takes to really live by the spirit. 
Brother Paul starts out in Romans chapter 8 with verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, Brother Peter, the Apostle Peter, he also warns us in 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The flesh is always warring against the spirit or against the soul. When we read the different warnings in Romans 8, we can see the warnings and the promises from Jesus as given through the inspired writer, Brother Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Romans, we'll start with Romans chapter 8, verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit are the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. We know that when we became born again, as we are told in John, the gospel account, as Jesus explains in John chapter 3, as it's explained in the book of Acts and uh, on the opening day of the church in Acts 2.38, we know that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, when we agree to repent and turn away from our old life, when we go down underneath that water and we are buried with Christ, and we come up a new creature in Christ, then we have the Spirit of God. And that is the only way you'll hear the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, then you are not part of God's family. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and that is the Holy Spirit that we receive, the gift of the Holy Spirit, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwell in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. Amen. It is important to take time to study out Romans 8, so that you really truly get an idea of the difference between living in the Spirit and living in the flesh. The Bible is the Word of God, written so that we can understand what it takes to have peace with God the Father, and what it is that Jesus is telling us. Because Jesus gave the written words to us so that we can study it out through the inspired writers using the Holy Ghost. And this is why we have the Bible, so we can have an understanding of what it takes to truly be a Christian a big C Christian, as the Bible explains. Again, keep in mind this fact. Through wisdom is a loving spirit, and the Holy Spirit will not adequate a blasphemer of his word. For God is witness of his reign, and a true beholder of his heart, and a hearer of his tongue. So we should know that, <clears throat> we should know and understand God sees all, God hears all, and God truly knows what is in your heart and what is your thoughts. And he knows what you are doing each and every day of your life. So we need to always be aware that God is seeing us. Brother James tells us in the written word found in James chapter 1 verse 22. 
He says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You know, too, all too often, most of us have a very high opinion of ourselves. We see ourselves in our minds, I, as something really totally great. And a lot of times we see ourselves so great that we look in the mirror and wonder who that is. How many people think about themselves looking one way, and then they look in the mirror and they see something totally different? Many people tend to forget about spots and blemishes and imperfections they may have on their body and their features of their face, and they may want to tend to forget about them until they look at themselves in the mirror. See, the Bible is the Word of God. It's an instruction book for us to have an understanding of what God wants from us, from the inspired writers. And it gives us examples of different situations that any situation you come across in your life, there's examples in the Bible for how to get around these things and what to do. And that's why we have it, so we can read it and we can study it. And we can tell what is good in the sight of God and what is evil in the sight of God. But another way to look at the Bible, the Bible is God's mirror for the soul. You see, you really should be, when you're reading the Bible, it should give you a reflection of how your soul is really doing. When you open up the Bible and start to read it, and if you take the time to truly study it out, you might find out what your, where your soul is really sitting with the Lord. And this is one of the things you have to do. You need to be able to see your own reflection of your soul as you're studying out the Word of God. Many times when we're honest with ourselves and we study the Bible, we may find out we're not really quite as close to the Word of God or we may not be quite as in alignment with the Word of God as we seem to think we are. And we need to make sure we truly understand that. We find it written in Proverbs 14. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are, are the ways of death. You know, this is the case with many people. Not only today, but all through since the beginning of time. So many people, they feel they're all right with God. I'm doing all right. I'm doing the best I can. You know, yeah, I went and heard the preacher preach today. And it sounds like I'm all right. But then they start studying the Bible. And when they start studying the Bible and are truthful with themselves, you'll start your reflection of your soul in the mirror of God may not look so good. To the many, many people will start looking into the Word of God and take a slight glance of themselves, and then they'll depart from their study. They don't want to see themselves in the mirror of God. Far too many Christians today do not want to see the spots of sin. They don't want to hear about their imperfection, their blemishes, because then they have to admit that they're doing something wrong. And far too many people today are too proud to humble themselves other sins. Far too many want to live as if everything is fine. Even despite the fact that they don't study the Bible during the week, even the fact that they may forsake the assembly here and there on different days, even though the fact that they don't pray daily to God for help and guidance, and even the fact that they don't live with Jesus in front of them as they're going, they got him behind him because they don't want to really kind of live that life. See, Jesus warns us in the gospel account as well. It's not just in the Old Testament. One of the things you find, a lot of the strong warnings that we have in the Old Testament, which is there for an example for us today, we find the same things repeated in what we call the New Testament. And what we find recorded in the gospel account, as told to us by St. John in chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. See, too many times we make the word of God of no consequence by our traditions, you know, 
we grew up, and we may not grew up in a church of Christ, so we're still looking at the old traditions of the old ways, and we've got all our friends around us and our family around us that really don't study the Bible, and we look at their traditions, and we think, eh, we're okay. I mean, eh, it changes the word a little bit, but, you know, God will understand. We see all around us also, many times, instead of studying out the word of God for ourselves, we'll rely on different men and women. You know, after all, they went to college. And they got all these words down. And they know Greek really well. And Hebrew really well. And, you know, they got interpretations of the scripture. How many times does the Bible say, don't be deceived. Don't be led astray. Be wary of being led astray. How many times? You know, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is an amazing character in the Bible. To me, he's one of the most amazing characters in the New Testament. And in 2 Timothy, he makes it very clear. In chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He didn't say read the Bible, kind of glaze over it. Hey, have your preacher read it to you. Hey, have your neighbor read it to you. He said study it. We need to study to be sure we are not being deceived. We need to study to be sure we are a good servant of Christ. We are servants of Christ. That is what we agreed to when we went underneath that water. We came up a new creature in Christ, a new servant in Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. The Apostle Paul also warns us in verse 16, Shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. See, we are to avoid conversations, especially about the will of God that are, not, that are not found in the Bible. Because when someone starts telling you what God wants, and it's not in this Bible, it's not in the written word of God, it's just babbling. It's just words that mean nothing. And all they're going to do is confuse people. And we don't need any more confusion in this world. The Bible... If the words are not in the Bible, then they are going to be incorrect words. And if they're vaguely describing the will of God, we don't want to use them because it will change the meaning of God's plan. How do you think we have all these different denominations? Because somebody sat down and start babbling and it says somebody opened up their book and saying, hey, wait, where's that at? They started believing them. And we already know that they rewrote so many Bibles now that they, a lot of them go along with it. So this is what's wrong. It's not God that created confusion. It's man. Really, it's the minions of Satan. I know people don't like you saying that, but it's the truth. That's what Paul would have told you. That's what Peter would have told you. The minions of Satan are the ones that's creating all these problems. We study to show ourselves approved unto God. When we're discussing the Bible, we need to make sure we studied so that we know what we're talking about and where to find it. We need to make sure that we show people who are spreading the falsehoods. This is not in the Word of God. This is not what the Word says. And most of the time, they will say, well, that's what we believe. Okay. But who died for you? Who died for you? Whose church is it? That is the question. We need to make sure we are not seen as the people talking about Jesus who are talking illogically or foolishly about the scripture. We need to be known as the people of the book. People that can open up the book. Show you where it, show, where it says how you are to be saved. Shows you how you are to live your life. Shows you that we should not be yoked together with people who are not the same faith. We should avoid sinners. There are a lot of people in this world today that truly are creating chaos, especially with our kids, and it's time that we stand up and tell people no more. So in the mirror of your imagination, you must view yourself as perfect specimen in the ways of Jesus, but God's looking glass is like those mirrors in an amusement park that distort your reflection. So you look at yourself as being great, but in God's mirror, 
you may see, look like you are, are five foot wide and two foot tall with some kind of funny expression on your face, or ten foot tall and thin as a toothpick. The Bible is God's looking glass. We have no idea what our soul looks like until we see ourselves as we really are reflected in the mirror of God's words. We need to look at our soul the way God sees us. We need to see ourselves in God's looking glass, the Bible. We can oftentimes see the reflection of ourselves in the lives of the characters in the Bible if you would stop and look at it this way. So far too often people look at the Bible as a bunch of words that were for 2,000 years ago. It is the living word of God today. It is for us today. Put yourself in that place. And that will help you to see what is going on. The fact is, if most of us would really see a real reflection in God's looking glass, it'd be the scariest thing you ever saw. It'd be the scarier than anything you ever seen on Halloween or any of the scariest movies ever made. So take a look at yourself in the mirror, the Word of God. It's like a three-way mirror at a clothing store. You can look in the mirror and see your soul from all sides, every possible angle. And don't expect the reflection to be too complimentary. Like the words of the nursery rhyme, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? You see, unless you have been really, really, really studying out the word, doing all you can to do what it is God wants, and even then, you're not perfect. So you're going to find faults, and you need to fix them. It is written, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, <clears throat> with a cart rope. We need to look at our soul the way God sees us. We need to see ourselves in God's looking glass, the Bible. Now some may look into the mirror and see the reflection and in, in, in an incident in the life of David and Bathsheba. You see, many times when we're looking at these characters in the Bible, many people say, well, I want to be like David. And it come to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now hold up the mirror of God's word. Do you see your own reflection as you watch things that you should not? Lust after women, or women lusting after a man that you should not be? The accusing voice of Nathan, the prophet of the king David, speaks to you. Thou art the man. David's sin was great. Don't look at it as being very lightly. It was a terrible price he paid for his sins. And he was forgiven by the Lord. But as he said, the sword shall not depart from his house. He had a son die in infancy. A daughter was raped by her half-brother, who in turn was murdered by another half-brother. A psalm rebelled against his father and was slain. Adiel, another son, was slain by Solomon. No wonder David declared that his sin was ever before him. The proverb states that the way of the transgressor is hard and was fully understood by David. You see, even Moses, as we just saw, was, had to pay a price for sin. The Bible is a mirror of our soul. Look again at the reflection of Felix in Acts 24. Felix sent for Paul. A prisoner concerning the faith, his faith in Christ, Jesus. Felix with Duracella, a woman who had been married to a small-time king, and Felix persu persuaded her to come because she'd be better off with him. And she was the daughter of the herald who had cut off the head of James. Now Felix wanted to hear Paul concerning the faith in Christ Jesus. At the time, the chapter said that Felix had more excellent knowledge concerning those ways. He already knew much about Jesus and about God, and Felix wanted to hear more about Jesus. This is always commendable when a person wants to add more to his knowledge of Jesus than he already knew before. Paul met the issue head on. He spoke of righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. Felix, like a lot of people today, was shocked when he heard that knowing more about Jesus has something to do with repentance for his sins. And the judgment day. Many are like Felix now. They like to hear about Jesus. They just don't want to hear what Jesus actually said. But Jesus is the living word. 
We cannot separate Jesus from what he said because what he said is what he is saying today. We got to get people to understand that Jesus is still speaking through the word. It is no different than if he was standing there telling you the same thing. When Felix heard the sermon, he trembled. He was convinced but not willing to give up his sin. He postponed salvation and told Paul, Go thy way, and when I have convenient time, I will call thee again unto me. Felix called for Paul frequently, heard him, but he never trembled again. God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. We need to understand that. You cannot stay in sin and expect God to always be there. We will do what God wants us to do when he tells us, or we may never get another chance to do it. We need to be careful and understand that we, as well, could become like Felix. You say, well, I was a saved, born-again Christian, but you say, I'm saved, I'm born again, I did everything right. Are you coming to the assembly on the first day of each and every week? Are you studying daily the Bible to stay strong in the Lord? Are you praying daily to make sure that you have an open communication with Jesus? Are you living your life as a Christian each and every day? I pray you are not like Felix and say to yourself or others who come to you and point this out, what may be wrong. I pray you're not saying, oh, I'll do this at a more convenient time. Also, every person who has heard the gospel of Christ and waited for a more convenient season needs to look at their own reflection in this account of another one who rejected Christ in God's mirror for the soul. Do you suppose Felix today is looking up and saying, why did I not listen? You see, that's how I see it. Another example of looking into God's mirror for the soul is found in the book of Acts. And the account begins a very significant way. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Up to this time, the church was on a roll. It began with a bang. 3,000 souls were added the very first day of Pentecost. And the number grew to 5,000. The enemies could not stop the steamroll process and the soldiers of the cross. And then all of a sudden, something went wrong. The first problem the church faced with that we can read about was from the inside. And it was over money. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife for as we are told, those two sold a possession and bought a certain part and gave it to the apostles as though it was the full amount. We need to be clear here. They didn't have to sell the land. They weren't asked to give this money. They did it on their own. And they didn't have to give the whole amount to the, to the church. That wasn't the problem. The problem was they acted like they did. They were boasting that they gave the whole amount. And I can hear in my head what they were probably saying, and this is only in my own head, but I'm sure they were saying, oh yeah, look what we did, look what we did, blah, blah, blah. They were looking to get approval from men. They were looking for men to put them up on a pedestal rather than approval from God. They lied about their account. Now the Bible account here shows us that when Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter asked them about this matter, and they lied, they dropped dead. It is sad to say, when we look at these two in God's looking glass, many of us will see our own reflection. Many will say through the years, I'm giving all I can give. I'm doing all I can do. But we need to understand this fact. Only God is qualified to say if we are lying to the Holy Spirit. The fact that many of us do not drop dead as we put our contribution in the offering plate does not mean that God has changed his mind about lying to the Holy Spirit. But looking at the story of Annas and Sophia, and many of us will see our own reflection in God's mirror for the soul. Another look into God's looking glass is the evangelist Philip. Philip was called by an angel to arise and go towards the south on the road that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he rose and went, and God did not tell him the exact destination. He just told him to go, and he rose and he went. And many of us can understand that Command. It is evident from our own lives and service that the Lord calls us to different missionaries and different things. Paul told the uh, Roman church, we have many members in one body and we have 
not the same office. We have all been called to serve in one way or another. And while we hear the audible voice of, we do not hear the audible voice of an angel anymore, we still have the Bible that shows us we should be talking and preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. Like Philip, none of us had any idea where the journey would lead when we first realized it was our duty to go. Our first duty is to rise up and go further, and instructions were given along the way. When he arrived at the right place, the Holy Spirit gave instructions to preach a sermon to a man who was going home after a visit to Jerusalem. The man was reading the scripture in the book of Isaiah, and Philip started at that point and preached unto him Jesus from that text. After the sermon, the man said, Behold, here is water. What does hither me from being baptized? Now we know that there was never a word in that what was written that Philip said anything about being baptized, but we know because of what the man asked that Philip had to be preaching about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and we know that he asked what hinders him from being baptized, that Philip had to tell him what it took to be saved in Christ. You cannot preach Jesus without including the necessary of being baptized, being born again, because the act of baptism was accomplished by going down into the water and coming up out of the water. Today, far too many good folks may tell you that they cannot be immersed because their dear old grandmother was never immersed and it's not important, and you hear all these excuses. But may I kindly ask, did Jesus say, if any man would follow me, let him take up his cross and follow your grandma? I don't think so. Are you looking into God's looking glass? Philip's preaching this sermon. Do you see reflection following Jesus? Or the image blurred? And you see yourself following the word of a preacher rather than the word of God. See, there's so many preachers out there that claim it's not important. But these preachers are lying. They are lying to you to keep you away from the blood. If the devil can keep you, if Satan can keep you away from the blood until your death, he won. <clears throat> as we talk to people, as we work the fairs, as we go into everyday life, we need to trust the Holy Ghost. We need to trust the Holy Spirit to help us bring the remembrance of what it is we should be talking to people about. That's why we study, so that we can have this remembrance come to us. Trust God. Trust Jesus. That's why we need to study. That's why we need to pray, so it brings to remembrance what we need. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, and this is the attitude we should all have. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, starting with verse 15, Brother Paul writes this. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I like to put in there, in Indiana also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This is the attitude we need to have. We need to have this attitude that you are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We need to have the attitude that the gospel of Christ is the power of God. And it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. And let them understand it has nothing to do with believing. It's believeth. It means you will do the actions. You will do the work. It's a continuous thing. The devil believes. The devil trembles. Man, don't tremble. Think of this. What if one Sunday we could hear... That kind of preaching of the gospel that was preached in the days of old. Can you imagine on one Sunday that the apostles could come back to this earth and they would preach the gospel message as it was preached in the days of the apostle? Can you imagine hearing Peter or Paul or, or Barnabas or James, Jude, even Timothy or Titus or any of the original evangelists preaching a sermon? Can you imagine that sermon, what it would be like? It would be music to your ears. But I'm afraid to say if this even could happen, if they came back and really preached the way they preached back then, 
we'd probably have a lot of people get up and leave. And I'd be afraid to say, and I'd be ashamed to say, most congregations would probably never invite them back. Because nobody wants to hear it today. We need people to start standing up and understand the power of God. What are you afraid of? The one true living God. We read in the Bible. I mean, what cannot God protect you from? It's amazing. I know. I've seen in a few years that I've been trying to be a servant of Christ. Most people don't want to hear the truth as it was preached in the days of the apostle. But when someone starts talking about sin and they see themselves in the mirror of God's word, they flee. They're like Felix and so many others that we read about in the Bible. But I'll leave you with these inspired words from the great evangelist, Paul, who tells us in the book of Romans chapter 16, verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scripture of the prophets according to the command of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Look into the mirror of God's word. Get your soul in alignment with God's word. Amen. Amen. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. We don't want to be like Felix. I mean, stop and think. Do you think Felix is not looking up? Because we know in the Bible they can look up. We just can't see down from heaven. We don't want to be there saying, why, Lord, I was so close. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ, for any reason, what is holding you out there? Get in the fold. Get inside the doors. The doors are wide open. If you have fallen out of the doors, repent and come back in. If you never came in in the first place, what's holding you out? Repent. Come to God. Come to Jesus. Be baptized. Be born again. Why are you on the outside? Do you realize when the fire storm comes, you need to be on the inside of the Lord's church? It's the only safe place there will be.